we were all shocked by a little article tucked away in last week's newspaper about two bodies which were left decomposing for weeks on the grounds of Le Repentier Cemetery in the abandoned city morgue. What does something like this have to say about us as a society? That the poorest and most vulnerable amongst us are left to rot in the open, exposed to scavengers and the elements. It's 2013. Gan is not at war. We couldn't fight a war. We're not experiencing a famine. A natural disaster has not struck us down. There's no mass civil unrest and according to the guys at the top, the economy is actually growing. So what's going wrong? What led us down this path where our kids can open up the paper and read about decomposing bodies being left close to a road other kids use to get to school? How are we defining the normality of the future? We decided to launch our first inquiry. In the Guyana of today, every stage of life is under threat, from the pregnant mothers and babies dying at the hospitals at alarming rates, to the young people who can't get jobs, to the workers who've lost their pensions, to the pensioners who can't live on their pension, to the cemetery which would make Jesus weep. But we weren't prepared for this. Welcome to Guyana. Real Guyana. One mark that distinguishes humans from non-humans, even though you may already know, is that humans have funeral rites. They regard something as due to the dead and have for a long time. From archaeological evidence, we know that burials occurred as long as 300,000 years ago, a practice among Neanderthals. Them. <laughs> Burial ceremonies vary from culture to culture, but one similarity most share is a respect for the dead. In Judaic tradition, for instance, as in many others, respect for the dead is a matter of paramount importance. Most communities have an organization to care for the dead, and their work is considered extremely meritorious because they're performing a service for someone who can never repay them. Disposal of human corpses. It's the practice and process of dealing with the remains of a deceased human being. Human corpses present both a sanitation and public health risk. Since the experience of death is universal to all humans, practices regarding corpse disposal are a part of every culture. Apart from times of war or natural disaster, where practical concerns may be forefront, many religions as well as legal jurisdictions have set rules regarding the disposal of corpses. Uh, but try to have a very peaceful uh, atmosphere for them with some, some books or magazines to read and we'll have coffee and such. We're going to go down the long hallway so we can kind of come in like a body would come in. We have a body lift, which this is the kind of thing typically used in nursing homes and such for uh, moving patients around so you don't have to use your back all the time. Uh, when a funeral home or transporter brings in a body, they will come through that door that's from a, an enclosed garage and so bodies can be unloaded privately without um, chance of any camera interference. Um, and they'll come in on their own stretcher and they have to be moved to one of our carts here. So you can, if they're light, typically they'll just move them themselves, but nowadays most people are pretty heavy and uh, we use um, the body. And then they get weighed on this four scale and if they're going to get an autopsy uh, right away, they can be wheeled into the autopsy suite, otherwise they will go in our cooler, which I think is no matter if it's decomp is in there, the smell never goes away. But uh, we have room for about 40 bodies, I believe, but we also have freezer space for um, long-term residents as well as decomposed bodies. Oh, we have a drying room a lot of time. Uh, clothing, of course, on the body comes in and it may be wet with blood or, you know, a pond or whoever, uh, whatever. We can uh, dry them nicely in a nice secure area. This is our autopsy suite. In our previous building, we had room where we could do one autopsy at a time. That, that, there was no working around, there was room for one. And there's some days that we have five pieces, which was very difficult. So now we have three full-time docs, and we can do really four to six autopsies. This is the National Cemetery, 
in Ghana's capital city, Georgetown. Here's what it used to look like just a couple decades ago. Here's what it looks like now. In most places, this would be abhorrent. And to most of us, it is. To imagine this is how your country would repay you after a lifetime of service. You could spend an entire day in here shooting footage just like this, but we'll go into more detail on the cemetery in another episode. What's important about it now is the context it will provide for what you see later. What about those two bodies we'd heard about inside the abandoned mark, and why was it abandoned in the first place? The Georgetown City Mark, located inside the grounds of Le Repentier Cemetery, took care of storing the remains of the unclaimed dead or decomposing bodies, which have been found after the incident resulting in death. These include the bodies of those who have drowned, commit suicide, died destitute and alone, or bodies discovered in an advanced stage of decomposition where identification is not immediately possible. These bodies require special fridges for storage. The only facility in the country with the right equipment and capacity was this ferry building. In just 10 years, this is what's happened to it. The compressor for the fridges was allegedly stolen. Then they broke down, and in its last days, one woman we spoke to told a harrowing tale of her family having to bear the grief of not only her brother drowning and washing up in a semi-decomposed state, but later having to ferry ice to and from the mortuary to place over the body on account of the broken fridges at the time. Here's a chronology of events leading up to the article which got this whole thing started. Realizing there was no cold storage in the country for decomposing bodies after the decline of the city morgue, I'm told by Lycan Funeral Parlor that they decided to build one themselves, albeit a smaller fridge than the one in the now defunct morgue. They then received the contract from the Guyana police force to store bodies which had died under suspicious circumstances or were too decomposed to store in the normal fridges at the other funeral homes. Lycan have at times found themselves with the problem of waiting extended periods for the police to give clearance for either burial or autopsy. So, for those corpses taking up space in their freezers with no family to pay for the extra storage time, they started depositing bodies in the abandoned morgue building, which at the time still had a roof at least. It is shocking to note that they have continued this practice over the years and residents around the area say every few months the parlor dumps a body or two in the broken building, open to the elements and within view of the public. I like you know, bring this one, pose and leave them in there, man. Like him. Like him, you know, a pal, oh. Yeah, I think that he's supposed to have a body, you know, to fill it up, you know, wow. For how long? I heard been going on for a long time. Yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah, they did want them, man, when they were over monthly, the rat right in there. The bones he left in the arm, can and stuff. So the man now, the police have to come and just carry the body. Bones for check, you know. Lycan have defended the illegality of this act by stating they simply placed the coffins there until the police are ready to deal with the necessary clearances. We called the assistant commission of police on the matter, and he hung up. I will do yard walking in the night, walking here, right? I built two, I built things, so I like you. It's also a coin, say, I'm a quarter, I'm meeting. Yeah. I come in when 8 o'clock, I left, came me that and come back. Watch. Aubrey, uh, this is my phone now. This is what he's doing. This is what he's doing. This is what he's doing. This is what Built yeah. two more kind of things. But I'm a part, and he's walking, man. Yeah. Me, he's walking the same place, but he come out from duty. Yeah. So I, I see the man now scratching people name into the tomb with sticks and things. Why no, was the name? Up? No, he's the name. When they done close off the door, mm -hmm. so they sit front to the tomb like that. Yeah. If you name Michael, like a right Michael, Joseph, date, you die date of birth, date of death. But you think it's right to scratch it in with a stick? That's not how it's always been done. No, well, everybody, well, this is the only thing I'm going to go up on the um, concrete. I mean, the concrete is soft. 
Do I know, but you ain't supposed to put it over well, the... Everybody, everybody, kids, oh, my dear friend, some people know this. Why they just mark it is that if they take three, four, five more months, they must come and they for find a tomb easy by your name. Oh, okay. But if you, if sometimes most of you come to and they don't find the tomb, yeah. you go, they go to the office, they look in the book, mm -hmm. and they find the location, the name of the person, and if it's A section, D section, Catholic, ground or old, uh, that's the body in there right now. The bodies are in there? Yeah, but they just watch. You are in there? Yeah. So how did we get here? The last reference to sourcing new parts for the fridges in the morgue was early 2009, after which junkies ransacked the roof and building for scrap metal, and the government chose to build a new facility at the Georgetown Public Hospital. It still wasn't big enough, and at times has offered the dead a level of protection one could say is on par with that offered by an open grave. These are just some of the incidents that have occurred within the past four years, starting in 2009. On March 31st, 2009, 54-year-old employee of the Chronicle News, Raymond Lynch, died after he was pinned in his car, which crashed into a ditch along the East Coast Highway. When the police arrived, they found him drowned, partially submerged in shallow water and mud. If that wasn't tragic enough, family members were peeved at the way his body was stored at the Georgetown Hospital mortuary. According to a relative, when they went to the mortuary to facilitate the post-mortem yesterday, Lynch's body was swollen. This was an indication that it was left exposed for the entire weekend instead of being placed in the refrigerator. In November 2009, the Guyana Observer News.org website reported that two weeks prior to their article, the relatives of a dead man turned up at the morgue at Le Repentier Cemetery to bury him, only to find his corpse lying in the grass and stray dogs feasting on him. By July 2010, the bodies were back on ice again, with Stabrook News reporting the aggravated decomposition of 23 hospitals in the hospital mortuary, as those fridges had developed mechanical problems over the weekend. April 2012, the autopsy of a 13-year-old boy was severely delayed owing to mortuary repairs. Moving forward to May 2012, where bids averaging $22 million were submitted to the National Procurement and Tender Administration Board for the provision of a new mortuary freezer. On October 8, 2012, the Guyana News Observer website again posted an image at the Georgetown Hospital mortuary, this time of someone's dead child dumped between a man's legs on the mortuary table, and went on to relate workers' complaints about deplorable conditions that they have to work under, and the shortage of tables and other equipment for the dead. That same weekend, on the 13th of October 2012, the grieving parents of 20-year-old Sue Brian Asana returned to the morgue to find their dead son's face half-eaten by rats. One newspaper related the account of hospital staffers, who said it was not the first time something like that had occurred. The employee said that the rats had eaten away the dead man's face and there was nothing that could avoid the rodents since the mortuary itself needed a complete makeover with a better sanitizing system. On the 16th of October 2012, management of the hospital issued a statement announcing it had purchased new fridges which should arrive in November. By now, they put down the prevalence of rats to be in a general environmental problem. Really? Oh, no worries if a rat eats your face off. It's a general environmental problem. Okay, so strangely enough, on January 25th, 2013, the CEO seems to have shifted the goalpost back a bit from work has been done in October 2012 to plans are in the pipeline in 2013. He also added that the incidents of rats eating corpses in the hospital mortuary will be a thing of the past. On March 4th, 2013, the Guyana Times newspaper reported Georgetown Public Hospital Corporation Chief Executive Officer Michael Kahn as saying that the hospital has received the new freezer for the mortuary. Kahn told the newspaper that tests were being done in the new piece of equipment and that as soon as the tests are complete, installation will commence. So tell us, how long do you think it takes to test out a freezer? We continued our exploration of the now abandoned mortuary, and it was shocking to note that even with two decomposing bodies in one room, 
There was a man sleeping rough in the other. We took it as a sign of the times. Mm -hmm. So this is your mortuary? Where? It's up, come. Mm -hmm. so the fridge is supposed yeah. to keep those bodies in? Yeah, well, remember the, the, the mortuary and what they went to use work. Mm -hmm. They use a How long has this been? Um, Profit money, I think about two or three, you know, into four years since it demolished. And why, why, why was it demolished? Because maintenance and all kind of that. Guys, you know, bad man is in it. Mine is near and it's still pretty. Mm -hmm. So, I was told that years ago, if you were poor, and nobody came. Poor dead. Yeah, poor but, dead. Um, if you're poor and nobody came to claim you. Oh, no, well, that's okay, but the car used to work at the car. No, well, I'm not like any car, you know, they get a contract from the police to pick up their picture. People are dead on the road. Their picture. I like more than one suicide case and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the police. Like in the after though, we don't feel bad with them. But like in the A1 now, poor, they're like, they're like, there are no people farming and they're like, fight. I remember if you're dead and you're going to farm your money and you're dead from the road, you might decompose. Nobody come and I'm going to be there for uh, two, three weeks, something a month, right? And then, like, you know, thing that I've called for it and say, well, and now they're going to send a bag in there. So they're putting a rock back. So the police really, after Lycan brings them here, the police are supposed to come and bury these people? No. The police now, the, the pal, you know, if, if they're like a couple weeks as a thing, right? Mm -hmm. Now the police now just give you a like a, well, tell them, well, okay, yeah, I could go ahead now and bury the body. You understand me? I mean, what got to happen? The full process, they come in, like this they person got to identify the body. But their body identified this one named Mackenzie. Yeah. Let's look down. Let's look. See if it's full. Well, just You see? You see? It struck me as I watched our friend use his boot to reveal the label in such a casual manner. That as shocking as I found it, now having knowledge of the practice, it had been going on for so long, he approached it with an air of indifference. This was how it was. I wondered about the kids I'd seen passing through on their way home from school. Was this normal to them too? What hope would we have of rectifying these problems in the future if one of them became president with even less of an environmental conscience than the current incumbent? By then, wouldn't it cease to be a problem? Wouldn't it be normal? The other coffin didn't have a name. The bag inside it also seemed hollow, and from the look of things, this was the corpse whose body I was told was recently devoured by scavengers. Not only does this incident bear haunting echoes of similar events in years gone by, but it's disturbing when you start to contemplate what it means. The ruling party have risen to power through solidarity with the Guyanese working class, and some would say, practicing racially divisive politics. If any two people in the whole of Guyana should come to represent the plight of the working class in present day Guyana, it's the two people that came in those tin boxes. It speaks of civil neglect in its most despicable form. It says that if you so happen to be poor, for whatever reason, if you so happen as to make that dreadful mistake, then you could end up chucked in a corner to rot, like this. That it doesn't matter what you did to lift yourself up out of your situation, and what opportunities you missed out on because you didn't have the right friends and connections. It says you don't matter. Instead, we focus on multi-billion dollar projects, 
for the benefit of tourists? Before the needs of ordinary Guyanese are met? Before your children no longer have to choose between getting run over and getting their school uniform wet when it rains because of the poor infrastructural development and maintenance? Get real. That's unacceptable. Even the tourists will come to see the truth. Here are some of the opinions voiced by other grave diggers I met on a visit four days later when I returned to find the coffins still there. Dark police pieces and dark children. Dark police. 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 Tell them by number of report they got engineer Robert again. You know, I'm going to say, 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 i if you put the condition of the compost, you bury them. I like to put a budget for budget and budget. So this has been going on for how long now? Okay, now for long. Long. All, all the time. All the time. Since March we closed. Don't be dying now. something. You take the compost body and tell like, can I go pay you keep it? I see how fast you can wrap them put in the fridge. So why them can't go in there? Why they can't get the same treatment? Or? <laughs> it's because they're poor. Good. I see the compost body come from here, the family come and they come and wrap it in the fridge till they're buried. Wrap it with thick plastic. That's yeah, how about it. This small tree here, you're going to eat in there. I really like never going to lose so long. You're going to eat in there. Eat. Eat your breakfast. Maybe you have to clean, clean, clean. You're going to rest up and you're going to eat. And I don't know what this is. All of these are for the well, people are looking for like potato and these fancy things. People are looking for so much. It's for health, the children are going to buy one play all these are for them. And all these are for them. Because everything is laughed. Good. Dark people in the thing. Dark is for them. Last time, we walked over to the bear bear because we cricket for the bear bear. We were able to cricket feel all of them. Because this is one of the best maintained areas. Because it's young and it's got one machine. Oh, it's machine my feet is there with a one man with a passport. And one man for weed. These great diggers, they are these great diggers. These men here got for weed yourself and dig yourself. Hold up. Did he just say that they only have one of these to take care of all of this? When alligators, snakes, trees and killer bees popping up out of every corner. That so much arduous work falls to these elderly grave diggers just to prepare one site? Uh, I think you could draw your own conclusions from that one. Here are a few facts from uslegal.com. The right to the remains of one's deceased kin for the purpose of providing proper burial has long been recognized as a legal right. The surviving next of kin have a right to the immediate possession of a descendant's body for preservation and burial, and that damages will be awarded against any person who unlawfully interferes with that right or improperly deals with the descendant's body. This right continues to be recognized by the courts notwithstanding the passage of many hundreds of years. In addition, the state has a recognized legitimate governmental interest in the provision of burial services in that the disposition of the dead is so involved in the public's interest, including the public's health, safety and welfare, that it is subject to control by law, 
instead of being subject entirely to the desire, whim, or caprice of individuals. In the exercise of its police power, the state may adopt reasonable regulations as to burials or other means of disposing of dead bodies. There is no question of the power of the legislature to exercise complete control of burials so far as is necessary for the protection of the public and the promotion of public safety. People have much to say about our past leaders, Burnham and Chetty and Chetty and Burnham, which we have little tolerance for because we live in the present. And there is no doubt in our minds that either of the founding fathers of our nation would have tolerated such a sorry and inhumane state of affairs. They had a sense of pride in our nation, and the impression we gave to those who visited us mattered. A sense of pride we find almost wholly lacking in the people we have handed the reins of power. A sense of pride many Guyanese at home and abroad still feel, though every year it's more overshadowed by the unease and shame of meeting someone in another country and having to say where you're from, lest they go home, look up Guyana and judge us personally on the filthy environment that shaped us and that we allow to deteriorate, even as it shapes our future leaders. So I ask you this, where is our pride and where is our voice? As you can hear, these guys can't speak for themselves. We met with Dr. Lycan at Lycan Funeral Parlor for their side of the story, as theirs was one of the main parlors alleged to be dumping the corpses and attended a press conference on the 26th at City Hall, so we could pose our questions to the mayor and councillors present as they made a presentation on the chronic lack of funds being experienced by the city. Now this is where it gets odd. When your mayor is telling you he's trapped for cash and big businesses are going up all around the city. Real Guyana found that this horrific situation at our cemetery, the morgue, the deplorable state of our roads, the garbage collecting at the side of our roadways and parapets, and these two decomposing bodies which started this whole journey are all linked together. We will go wherever injustice takes us, and an injustice to the dead is an injustice to the living. Follow us over the next couple weeks as we present a three-part series which aims to get to the bottom of our city's garbage heap. We started by speaking to the guys on the ground, but this was just the beginning. And here's something worth noting. So it is at the top, it will be at the bottom. See you in part two. But in the meantime, we leave you with this question. How much are you really prepared to take from people who have no interest in your well-being? Change has never come easily, but it's always worth fighting for. Welcome to Guyana. Real Guyana.